magic is indeed happening at Baltimore Clayworks. On my right we have Steve Holbert, who has been on the Baltimore Clayworks Board of Trustees since 2015, um, and is an avid home brewer, yes. and member of the home brewing group Baltimore Brew in Baltimore, Maryland. Then next to him, we also have Ben Freund, uh, who is a resident artist at Baltimore Clayworks, and he is, his work explores the, the interaction between uh, humans and how we're looking at, at uh, empirical knowledge and, and what can be more magical and empirical than how we study homebrewing and beer and, and what's going on there. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Steve, uh, Steve Holbert and Ben Freud. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ben Freund. I'm, like you said, one of the um, uh, resident artists at Baltimore Clayworks. I've been there about five years. Uh, uh, though if you ask me, I'd, I'd tell you I'm from all over Orlando, Denver. I lived in Northern California for a while. Um, I, I also want to note, uh, if you hear a crying baby, please be patient with it. It's mine. Uh, so. Very good. Yeah, Steve Holbert, uh, home brewer, a proud member of the board at Baltimore Clayworks. Phenomenal organization. Uh, also a member of Balti Brew. Hello over there. I won't get to see you for the rest of the talk, but I wanted to say hi. Okay. All right, you ready? Yes, sir. So, Ben and I met a couple of years ago. At the time, uh, I was uh, talking with Sarah McCann, a former director at the uh, Baltimore Clayworks, uh, about coming onto the board. And being a home brewer, I take any opportunity to talk about making beer. And I said, Sarah, I have, have to tell you this story. I, I was reading this article in the, in, on the web uh, about an experiment that was done uh, at the Great Lakes Brewing in Cleveland. And it caught my attention because I went to graduate school in Cleveland. So I was like, oh, OK. Um, uh, and they were collaborating with the Oriental Institute, which is part of the University of Chicago. And that caught my attention because I went to school there. Uh, and the Oriental Institute was the first place that I, uh, I took an astronomy class, which is why I was in graduate school in Cleveland for astronomy. And um, the class was the Ancient Astrology and Astronomy of Babylonia. It's pretty cool. But here they are. They're trying to resurrect a recipe from the Sumerian goddess of uh, beer, Ninkasi. And so they tried to do this um, sort of 4,000-year-old recipe. And they made the beer in clay in Cleveland, of all places. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could figure out how to do that in Baltimore on sort of the homebrew scale? And Sarah said, hey, you need to meet, meet Ben. And so Ben and I hooked up at, uh, this picture taken at uh, Mount Washington Tavern, just uh, around the corner from Clayworks. And we started our conversations. Yeah, luckily, uh, Clayworks is 12 steps from a, a very nice tavern. Uh, yeah. So we sat down with a couple local brews and talked over the different, uh, yeah. uh, the different crafts of potter and brewer. And, and uh, that day we embarked on a long series of ex experiments. And yeah. That brings us here today uh, uh, in the hopes of getting others involved in, in those experiments and try to share what we're doing. Yeah. We actually did our first brew about two years ago, uh, just in April, as you can see. Um, we had to wait for the snow to stop because we're brewing outside. Um, we had a show at Clayworks, which was very exciting. Uh, we got to serve some of our beer at the show. Uh, can't sell it, just to remind you, right? Homebrew cannot be sold. The federal government frowns upon that. Um, we, also got to, uh, we also got to present last year at the American Homebrewer Association National uh, Homebrew Conference, which was held in Baltimore. And uh, we had a crowd such as yourselves uh, sitting in front of us. Um, the one advantage that they had that unfortunately you don't have is that we had 20 gallons of beer that we made in clay pots that we were serving that day. Sorry. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't figure out how to transport that <laughs> from Baltimore uh, out this way. But uh, if you're ever in Baltimore, give us a call. We'll happily serve you some of our beer. So as a home brewer, I knew how to make beer. I had you know, large stainless steel vessels, um, sort of 10 to 15 gallon size. And I said to Ben, well, make me a clay version. So this pot that you see to the right uh, was one of the, I guess, the first pot that Ben made. Uh, it's about 13, 14 gallons. And it looks a lot like uh, the steel pots that I use. Uh, we were kind of going from how I knew to make beer. Yeah, the original concept was to approach things uh, much the way a home brewer would. 
uh, except instead of trying to brew uh, some esoteric Sumerian beer uh, that I can't relate to, uh, we were going to brew modern beers, uh, specifically like American pale ales, uh, which is one of our go-to recipes, because I, I, I can't relate to a Sumerian beer, but I know what American pale ale tastes like. I know really well, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and so I can kind of use that as a control. Uh, so I, I built pots that were basically clay of approximations of those a home brewer uh, would use. Uh, although I didn't really know quite what I wanted. I, I, I knew I didn't want high fire glazed pots, um, but I didn't know what it was I did want. Uh, these two, yeah, they're both in the, right. in the what, 15 gallon range. Yeah. Uh, and at the time they were the, the biggest pots I had ever made. Uh, just coil and throw. Uh, and uh, it's a, a commercial sculpture body, cone six sculpture body. Uh, I fired it to about cone one because I still wanted some porosity involved. Yeah. Um, so actually to comment on this pot on the left, so the other idea I had was um, friends of mine who brew uh, um, are the envy of the homebrew group if they uh, own these uh, large wooden casks and they make beer and wooden casks in their basement. I don't have room in my row house in Baltimore for wooden cast, but I thought maybe I could uh, get a clay pot to behave the same way that a wooden barrel did. So the one on the left was designed for aging beer or conditioning beer. We'll talk about that a little longer, a little later rather. But um, that's why I have these kind of two different designs, the one on the right for actually making the, the beer from the, from the start and the one finishing it off. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is my standard homebrew uh, setup uh, outside. You know, I have the little canopy because it rains as it did that day. Uh, there you see the pot that you saw in the previous picture. We have a pointer somewhere. Uh, okay, anyway, you see the pot. And it's sitting on a propane burner. Um, uh, if you can peek right behind it, you'll see a stainless steel uh, pot that I use. You'll notice Ben has something in his hand. He's drinking. Um, I learned early on. Uh, if you're making beer, you're drinking beer. And so we always drink beer when we make beer. It's one of the... It's only right. It's only right. It's only right. And we did. We went about things uh, uh, the way a home brewer would. We just plopped that pot right on top of a propane uh, burner. Uh, I had a lot of trepidation about that. Uh, but we did it. Uh, All right. Yes, sir. And then for the second brew, we, we just took the whole thing and uh, set it up on some kiln bricks. So there's a reason we did this. Do you want to tell them why we moved to the wood fire? Uh, because I was worried about the propane. So propane burns at a really high heat, and I was worried about it cracking the pot. Um, and so for the second brew, we, we just propped it up on bricks and built a fire underneath it. I'm actually just adding the strike water, the original water, uh, to the pot right there. Uh, but if you look at the very bottom of the pot, uh, by where that one brick is, you can maybe anticipate the next slide. Yeah. All right. Next slide. Ready? Yes, sir. Ta-da! So things ended very quickly, uh, the way some experiments do. Yeah. Um, and this pot failed exactly where I'd expect it to. And uh, there'll be more on why that's exactly where I would have expected it to a little later on. Um, so we went back to the drawing board. Uh, on the plus side, uh, I did think this would be a very good pot for growing potatoes. So it's now in my garden. You just grow the potatoes, you lift it up, all the potatoes fall out. Yeah. So at least there's some innovation there. Indeed. And no waste. No waste at all. Yeah. Um, so we went back to the drawing board. And forget about beer for a minute. A minute. All I really needed was a pot you could boil water in over a wood fire. Uh, and ancient cultures all over the planet have been doing that for centuries. So it was time to figure out why their pots worked and mine didn't. Uh, so I decided to look at cultures that are actually still doing this today, um, specifically African cultures. Uh, and I went looking at the materials uh, and techniques that some African cultures still use today. Um, I knew they were using a ton of um, what archaeologists would call temper in their clay. Uh, what most potters would think of as grog is a very good temper. Uh, I knew they were using surface clays, uh, what we would think of as, uh, say, earthenwares. Um, uh, and I stumbled up upon what was, for me, uh, the most important part of the puzzle, uh, while watching a, a YouTube video. Luckily, in, in, in our information age, uh, there was no end of uh, pictures and videos for me to watch. Um, uh, and I was watching a video by a, a gentleman named Christopher Roy. Uh, I hope his last name is Roy. I've never met him. It might be Wa, like the hockey player. Uh, so I'm just guessing. It's Christopher Roy. And if you haven't heard of him, he's a professor of uh, African art history at the University of Iowa. 
and he makes some great ethnographic videos, uh, including one on beer. And while watching an excellent one entitled African Pottery Farming and Firing, uh, Mr. Roy makes the following statement, and I'm going to quote him here. Uh, like all American and European potters, I picked up African jars and tapped them with my fingers to see if they were fired to the right temperature. Of course, they made a thunk instead of a ring because they were low-fire earthenware. I thought it'd be nice to teach them how to fire their pottery to a higher temperature. Then I discovered that they didn't want high-fire pottery because the low-fire earthenware they made could be used for cooking over an open fire, while higher-fire pottery would shatter if exposed to open flame. It soon became apparent to me that the techniques that African potters used represented appropriate technology. That is, Africans had developed techniques to make pottery that suited their needs, but whose manufacture did not consume precious or expensive resources. Excuse me. Um, that term, appropriate technology, uh, spoke volumes to me. You see, nothing these potters uh, were doing uh, um, was primitive. Uh, but instead represented a full and fitting utilization of the materials available to them. Uh, this not only gave me a great in insight to my own problem of the, the broken pot and how to boil water, uh, specifically that I needed to keep my pots in the really low fire range, uh, but it was a revelation in the way, uh, in, in the way I uh, viewed traditional pottery. Uh, uh, it, it's not uh, something primitive. Uh, it's uh, them utilizing the uh, materials around them uh, to their fullest. Um, so what did the right pot look like for us? Um, this again is an African version uh, and I'm not going to tell you what, what the exact right pot is. Uh, um, it could be a lot of things, just what's right for us. Um, first of all, it's round bottom. Uh, this was the most obvious step because it eliminates the tension created between wall and floor trying to expand and, con and contract in different directions. Uh, I don't know if you guys understand this, but the, the, the floor is trying to expand and contract horizontally, the wall vertically. Uh, the tension created between the two is exactly why the, pot, uh, the bottom fell off of my first pot. Um, uh, you see the body of the pot's nice and round, uh, nothing dramatic. Uh, it should probably have a neck, uh, but that neck needs to be wide enough to easily get a thick slurry of, gl of grain and liquid out. Uh, it should probably have a lid, though it doesn't necessarily need to. Uh, and if you do a lid, make it a simple one. Uh, a gallery in the neck is probably going to chip and break as you're stirring and using the pot. Um, go to the next one. For the clay body, uh, you can see it a little bit here. Uh, I just started using uh, the waste from Baltimore Clay Works. Uh, we collect it all. Uh, and uh, for a little bit, we were just throwing it out. Um, so I. Uh, um, took all our waste. It's a combination of high fire, low fire, uh, as you all know, sometimes bits of bisque or sponge, uh, the random tool, uh, and I, I slaked it down. Um, and then to that I added a combination of medium uh, and coarse grog, uh, somewhere in the range of 40 to 60 percent. Um, I, I threw in some talc, uh, maybe around 5 percent. Uh, if you've got some pumice, that's a good addition as well. Uh, and the honest truth is I'm really kind of fast and loose. I really play fast and loose with these clay bodies. Um, and it didn't matter a whole lot because of my firing temperatures uh, that I was using a combination of high fire and low fire clay. I wasn't going to temperatures uh, um, high enough for it to matter. Uh, if you wanted to try a micaceous body, that's certainly an option uh, and one we're actually considering. Um, however, since most uh, ancient cultures had no problem without access to naturally occurring uh, micaceous clay, I didn't see a real need to use it. Uh, the, result, the resulting clay body is not a plastic one uh, at all, uh, and so building techniques have to be appropriate. You're not going to throw this clay. Uh, first, the grog's going to shred your hands, uh, and second, as soon as you try to do a pull, uh, you're going to rip the clay apart. Let's go to the next one. So uh, a decade or so ago, as part of a ceramics history course uh, taught by Kathy Holt in Colorado, uh, I taught myself how to pound clay spheres uh, using an ancient African technique that requires just a small uh, bowl-shaped depression in the ground. Uh, and that's perfect for making the bottoms, the rounded bottoms of these pots. Instead of a hole in the ground, I just use unfired clay forms. Um, and I'm going to try to show you a little bit of this. I have to apologize. I, I tried to find a way for this to translate really well. You want to do it? Um, but we just start with um, just, it's just a bowl. It's just a solid clay bowl. Uh, you pound a little clay, and then you rotate it and pound it. And then you rotate it and 
put it up on its side a little bit and pound it and rotate and pound and rotate and pound and rotate and pound. Um, it doesn't quite translate in the slides, so right before I left, I made a video. Uh, I'm trying to upload it to YouTube. It should be there as soon as I get a good internet connection. Uh, that actually shows you the entire process of me pounding a sphere, uh, a complete sphere, just using a shallow depression in the ground. Um, so uh, as soon as I have a good internet connection, I'll upload that to YouTube. Please feel free to take a look at it. Uh, so once you've got that base, um, it's just coil and paddle. Um, I'll use a rib for smoothing. Uh, remember, this is not coil and throw. It's not out of coil and then do a pull. Uh, oftentimes you get these things spinning a little bit and my instinct is to do a pull. Uh, but with clay this short, you're just gonna rip it. Um, compression is definitely helpful. So a good paddle as well as an anvil, something to pound against are helpful. And don't be afraid to leave it thick. And I mean well over an inch, it's fine. Uh, and that's it, it's nice and simple. This is the first one that worked consistently for us. It's about a three gallon, gallon pot. Um, and we brewed in this, fermented in this. Uh, quite a number of times um, until we uh, moved to a larger pot and retired it. Uh, we didn't retire it for any real reason other than we were moved to larger, moved to bigger pots. Indeed, sitting uh, in my fireplace. Yeah, it's sitting in your fireplace. Yeah. It looks great. It does, it's uh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the, the real key to making these pots work, and at least in my opinion, um, and to making a pot that you can put over a wood fire and maintain a rolling boil uh, is less about the form and less about the clay body and more about the firing temperature. You see, a glassy high fire pot isn't gonna survive the thermal, thermal variations involved. However, a nice, soft, porous, open, low fire pot's gonna do much better. So these pots are only fired in the range of 020 to 018, okay? So when I say low fire, I mean really, really low fire. That's barely permanent, all right? Uh, this, of course, means we have a very, very porous pot. Uh, so far, at least, when it comes to the brew process, we haven't bothered trying to seal them for a number of reasons. Uh, first, anything we use to seal it is going to get into our beer, and that's no good. Uh, and second, uh, at least for the brewing, for um, what we're going to call mashing and boiling, we haven't seen much of a need. Uh, that, however, changes quite a bit when we get to fermentation. Okay. So here we are in the real world. This is uh, behind the Clayworks studio building. To the right, you see the wood kiln. To the left, you see uh, a temporary kiln that was built as part of a collaboration with Johns Hopkins University. This is some ancient Greek design. Um, but in the middle, in the back, you see our little pot sitting in its little fire ring. This is where we brew our beer. Uh, you don't see us. Uh, we're out of the picture with beers in hand. Uh, so, uh, this is the new design in action, like it says. Uh, you can see uh, it's just the rounded bottom is just resting on a bed of sand. It's just that easy. Just put it on a bed of sand and roll it around a little bit. It'll be fine. Uh, and you can see we're not using direct heating. We're using indirect heating. Just start a small fire. Just start a real small fire and let it go. Uh, it's going to take a while to heat up, um, but it's fine. Uh, and, we, and go slow. Don't be afraid to go slow. It actually helps the brewing process, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. And three hours later, uh, we're at a full rolling boil. You can see at this point we've built the fire up quite a bit, uh, but still no indirect heating. There's you know, no reason to pile coal, coals on it. Uh, it gets plenty hot enough, uh, and we can maintain a rolling boil as long as we want. Yes, sir. There you go. Uh, this is one of the larger pots. Uh, what, this is about six gallons. We use it to brew batches in the five gallon range. Uh, so it holds about five gallons of water, uh, 10 pounds of grain. Uh, and uh, I think when you first fire these pots, they're just, uh, I mean, it's the color of uh, any uh, uh, low fire clay, uh, um, terracotta. Uh, but after a few uses, I think they really start to be beautiful. Uh, this is actually in a show at Baltimore Clayworks of where we tasted uh, quite a number of beers. Right. Um, all right, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about, about brewing in case you're not familiar with the details. Uh, there are traditionally steps that we go through in, in executing the recipe of making a beer. Um, and the first step is uh, termed mashing. 
And uh, basically, uh, we take malted grain, barley traditionally, but it can be wheat, other things, and we soak it in hot water, uh, sort of in the 140 to 160 degree range. The reason we do this is that uh, the malted barley uh, was actually barley that's been germinated and then dried, um, has enzymes in it, which convert the carbohydrates, excuse me, the starches in the, uh, in the grain into sugars. And at the end of the day, we want sugar, and we want lots of sugar, and that's because yeast eat sugar and make alcohol. So the more sugar we get, the more alcohol we get. So we, in a situation as you see in this picture, um, uh, I actually have the grain in a large nylon mesh bag, like a giant tea bag with 10 pounds of malted barley in it. Um, soaking, we would soak it for about an hour. On this day, we soaked it for an hour. Uh, the water is at about 150 degrees in this case. At the end of this, we just lifted the bag out. And so we removed the uh, grain from the water, which now had sugar in it, uh, once you have sugar in water when you're brewing, uh, you call that solution warped. So uh, at the end of this, we had a clay pot full of wart. And you can see about how much liquid we, we had there. You can see how it's been, the color changes at the bottom as the liquid is being absorbed by the pot. Um, let's see. Just a sec. All right, that's good. We'll do the next one. Once we have the wort, uh, we boil it. And this is boiling wort in our clay pot uh, in the backyard of Clayworks. Um, we boil for a couple of reasons. Uh, traditionally, beer was used to uh, supplement water supplies, especially if the water supplies were uh, contaminated. By boiling, we sterilize the water. So now we can drink this stuff, right? Um, as Ben pointed out, we've been using a, a modern American pale ale recipe as our control. Uh, American pale ales have hops in them, and you must boil hops in order to extract the bitterness from them. So we need to get the grain, or we need to get the uh, wort boiling to sterilize it, and we need to have the hops in this boiling mass to uh, get some bitterness so that we can uh, get this kind of recipe that we want. And I apologize for the jerkiness of the video. It's really hard to get a camera to focus on boiling water through all that steam. Uh, after we have boiled as long as we want, uh, we cool the beer, we cool the wort. Uh, in our case, we just put a lid, <laughs> we, we scoop the coals away, we put a lid on top of the, the clay pot, and we come back the next day. Yeah, just leave it. Yeah. And then Ben, picks up the pot and carries it inside to the studio. I, I supervise. <laughs> They're heavy. Um, so here, if you look closely, you should see some little motion on the surface. First of all, it's green. It's green because the hops have risen to the top, and the hop flowers are green. So you have, we have this mass of hops in there. But then the uh, little bubbles that you're seeing breaking on the top of the surface there, at the surface are actually the CO2 that is one of the byproducts of the yeast consuming the sugar. I already mentioned the most important byproduct, alcohol, but it also produces CO2, and that's what we're seeing here. Now we do, um, we're making ales, so we're doing ale yeast, using ale yeast, uh, brewer's yeast, and these typically prefer to ferment at sort of 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This fermentation is happening inside the Baltimore Clayworks studio, right in in my studio, right yes. In studio. It smells wonderful. Um, right above the classroom, so you know everyone can share. And uh, it uh, it's it's effectively room temperature, so it's appropriate for the yeast. And you can see that they're happy in that. Thing, and this is real time. This is not sped up at all. Right. Yeah. All right. Next. The final phase, and one that turns out to be pretty important, um, and one that really I was interested in was the, uh, the final step of fermentation is called conditioning or aging. And here you see the 14 gallon pot. This was the second pot that Ben made. Uh, this was the one that I had the idea, uh, let's have a clay version of a wood barrel. Uh, this is in, um, it's in a plastic bucket because of that porosity. 
I'm going to talk about more, more about what that led to. But um, this is in my living room. Um, I have two uh, temperature-controlled rooms in my house, uh, my bedroom and my living room. And my wife and I agreed that I wouldn't put the beer in the bedroom. Uh, so here it is in the living room. All those plastic buckets are filled with beer. Uh, usually I, I ferment in plastic. It's a very standard kind of home brewery kind of thing. Um, this beer, uh, or, or this, this purpose here was then to let the yeast continue to work on the wort even after the primary fermentation had taken place. Now during the primary fermentation, all the simple sugars are, are readily devoured by the yeast. But there are other things in that wort that giving the yeast a little extra time uh, helps uh, result in a, a tastier beer. There are some more complex sugars that given enough time, some of the, the yeast can, can devour. But there are also some intermediate products in the fermentation that given time, the yeast will clean up themselves. So at the end of the day, if you let your beer age, you might not think of beer aging, but if you let it age, even just a couple of weeks, you will improve the flavor. And so we're looking, we're looking to do that. In the case of these uh, Belgian beers I mentioned, or the, um, these, maybe I didn't mention those, but some of these uh, make use of uh, bacteria to produce sourness, and giving them time to fully develop will also improve the flavor. Thanks. So one of the biggest things in, in this, uh, in all our series of experiments was uh, to simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, some of the, stuff, the steps he's going over are, are quite complicated. Uh, we simplified the step, uh, the mashing uh, and boiling process all into one. So literally, we just put everything in the pot at once. Just water, grain, hops, all go in the pot right at the beginning. Uh, and then start heating up slowly. Uh, and again, slow seems to be the key. You can actually get these things to a boil uh, fairly quickly if you wanted to. Uh, but you're not going to convert enough sugars uh, and you're not going to have a very good beer. Uh, so then we bring... Well, the, I'll comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, the mashing technique that we talked about where we kept, kept the beer at, uh, say, 150 degrees for an hour, we need to replicate that somewhere in this, warm, this heating process that we're showing here. So over the course of the three hours that we're bringing it up to a boil, we need the, the liquid to be in this sort of 150 degree range for a fairly decent amount of time. Okay, not an hour, but at least, you know, half an hour. Uh, to let those enzymes convert the starches to sugars. If we heat it too fast, then the heat uh, denatures the uh, proteins that are the enzymes that do that conversion. And we've had some problems where we've heated them too quickly, um, and then we have a problem where the beer doesn't convert. Beers that have a lot of starch in them uh, actually will have a vegetal flavor to them. It's, it's fairly conspicuous. Um, so we try to drag out this, uh, stretch out this heating process so that we can uh, still get a mashing activity going on, even though everything's all in one pot. And then the whole uh, slurry comes to a boil. Um, and this was actually uh, counter to everything we were told uh, by brewers. You never, ever, ever boil uh, your grain. Um, we did. Uh, and didn't seem to have a problem with it. Yeah, home brewing 101, don't boil your grain. If you boil your grain, you will extract tannins, and if you have tannins in your beer, it's gonna taste bad. So don't get any grain into anything that you're boiling. Your wort should be grain free. But we throw everything in there, uh, we boil madly away. And we didn't find that to be true at and all. And we didn't find it to be true at all. Um, and we can maintain this rolling boil as long as we want. Uh, sometimes for um, uh, certain beers, uh, you you maintain a boil for quite a long time. Yeah. Uh, for instance, everybody knows Dogfish 90. That's because it's boiled for 90 minutes. Yeah. Um, we typically don't go that long because we get a lot of water loss, uh, liquid loss uh, from the boiling uh, and also through the porosity of the clay. Yeah, so uh, the problem with these pots is that we put the grain in there, so that takes up space in the pot. Um, the grain absorbs some water. Typically, uh, the barley we're using will eight pounds of barley will absorb a gallon of water. So we're really um, trying to get a balance here where we can get enough liquid out at the end of the day to call it a beer, you know, make it worth our while, and yet have the pot small enough so that we can uh, handle it. After the um, disastrous pot breaking uh, brew, uh, I, 
I posted this to Facebook and my homebrew buddies chimed in and they said, hey, you should do this old school uh, German technique called Stein beer. Uh, Stein meaning stone. And back in the day, the Germans would brew beer in wooden vats. Now obviously they're not putting the wooden vats on direct fires, let alone indirect fires. But they would have their wooden vat and they would fill it with the wort and then they would transfer, transfer hot granite rocks into the wort to heat it. And once the rocks cooled off, they'd take them out and they'd replace them with other hot rocks. So we did the clay version of this. Uh, ben built a 10 gallon clay pot specifically for this activity. And instead of granite, we used fire brick. And we just plopped the fire brick on our wood fire and got it hot and then we used um, tongs to transfer it into the pot. And the minute you put it in the pot, of course, it boils and spits, makes a lot of noise. And then it would calm down. We take that out. We put another one in. We kept that going until we brought it to a boil. And then we kept it boiling for an entire hour. And this was a ton of fun, I have to say. It was uh, it, it literally, we're just heating. Uh, those are just, uh, what, half and quarter fire brick uh, or, or soaps. Um, and there is a layer of uh, um, brick on the bottom of the pot so that the hot bricks don't come in contact with the cold bottom of the pot. Okay. Um, but a ton of fun. Uh, if you have uh, some raccoon tongs and uh, some fire brick, uh, please give this a try. Uh, yeah. When it boils over, it's a ton of fun, but yeah. please use clean raccoon tongs. Well, it, and it is clean funny though. Fire brick. <laughs> it is funny. One of the features of, of the brick is that uh, it picked up some of the soot from the actual fire, right? It was just sitting on top of the burning logs. And so at the end of this, the wart was gray, right? The, the liquid itself was wasn't actually gray, but that all dropped out at the end of the processing and uh, we had normal looking beer, but we had a smoky beer. Very. There was this little smoky taste that you could get. Um, and we served this at the uh, opening. We had at Clayworks. This was a This was a fantastic beer. Yeah, it was a good beer. Yeah, so here are just a couple of the experiments that I've done. Here's a small clay pot. This one actually is glazed. I think Ben will talk about that a little more later. But in this one, I'm making the, a Belgian-style Lambic beer. This is one that uses not only regular uh, brewer's yeast, but uh, a version called Britannomyces, which is uh, very popular in Belgian beers and is responsible for a, a well-known flavor described as follows. I, I promise I don't make this up. Wet horse blanket. The prize flavor from this yeast is wet horse blanket. And into this I also introduced two bacteria, um, lactobacillus, which is responsible for um, kimchi, sauerkraut, yogurt, right, all those good things, um, and uh, uh, pediococcus, uh, both of which make lactic acid, which makes the beer sour. The beer lived in that pot uh, for two months uh, before I kegged it. All right, and this is the big pot again that you saw early on, sitting on, in my kitchen. Uh, I've now covered it with uh, beeswax. Um, we, we've been concerned about the porosity. We're gonna talk about some of the more challenging issues with that. So I had coated this with beeswax. I heated it up using a hair dryer and then sort of melted the wax into the outside. Uh, in this one, I brewed a uh, Berliner Weiss beer, which is a German style sour wheat beer. The wort is first soured. I, I, I dump the bacteria in there and it becomes sour with lactic acid. And then I pitch the yeast and ferment it. And I did that all in that pot. And that spent about three weeks in there for that, doing that process before I uh, kegged that beer. That turned out to be an exceptionally tasty beer. Uh, and this is probably the most important thing to remember, uh, regardless of what technique we're using. Uh, regardless of uh, the experimentation. Uh, when we're done, we, ha we have beer. Yeah. We have beer. Uh, we like beer. We like beer. Uh, there are some problems, though. Remember, these are very porous pots. Uh, and for the brewing, uh, actually mashing and boiling, uh, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Uh, but once we start fermenting uh, and once we start conditioning, uh, the porosity does become a problem and seepage is that problem. Uh, this is actually uh, a pot that we tried to glaze. I, I fired it, we used it. 
and I tried to glaze it after the fact um, to try and cut down the porosity. The glaze did not fit very well. Um, and you can, if you look close, you can see some of the crazing, uh, but you can definitely see the seepage. So let me comment. So yeah. this is the uh, pot that I pointed out that I brewed the Belgian Lambic in. So this was in my living room doing this. Um, this speaks to why that large 14-gallon pot was in the big blue uh, bucket. Um, again, my wife and I had a conversation. We decided, you know, the, the plastic would be a good idea. Um, yeah. So again, seepage. Uh, this is uh, that six-gallon pot. Uh, that we've used over and over again. I think we've gotten a dozen beers or more out of this. Uh, uh, at several points, we just uh, brewed, and then when we were done and everything was cool, instead of just pulling the liquid out and fermenting that, uh, while the grain and everything was still in it, we just threw in yeast and let it go. Um, the problem with that is uh, when first you get the seepage, uh, like you see on the left, the little dots start to form. Uh, but once that starts to ferment uh, and the yeast gets to those little... Uh, uh, those little drips, uh, it starts to foam up like you see on the right, and you just get these foam rivulets uh, uh, covering your pot. Um, and that stuff, uh, it, it's hard to tell here. It looks fairly liquidy. It is not. Uh, it is syrup. I affectionately call it beer honey. Uh, it's the thickness of molasses. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's your wort. It's your unfermented beer coming straight through the surface of the pot. And it's important to remember that since it is coming through the surface of the pot, it is also completely filled, that porous matrix of the wall of the pot, okay? So that is, it, it's just completely penetrated your pot and it's in there. Um, and that can lead to some problems. But first, the good news is that, um, uh, or, or rather the bad news, we're gonna do the good news in a minute. The bad news is that if you're getting sugar outside of the pot, that means the yeast are not turning that into alcohol. So we're quite concerned about this process, right? Because uh, sugar is at a premium and we want the, the yeast to have as much as possible to eat to give us as much alcohol as possible. All right. So this is the problem with seepage, uh, fungus. Uh, and it tends to grow, and this is, I, I thought this was a little strange, but it tends to grow mostly where there isn't airflow. So this is actually the bottom of that pot after spending seven days, going through the full boiling process and then spending seven days fermenting with yeast. Uh, and uh, when you turned it over, uh, it was just covered like this. Uh, and it's because of those, those sugars. Uh, and remember, this penetrates your pot too. So the, the beer itself was fine. Um, the fungus was only on the outside. Uh, and the cure tends to be airflow. So even with the ones we're just brewing in, uh, when you scrub them, clean them, uh, we, I just scrub them down with hot water uh, and a Brillo pad, no soap, no anything, because remember, they're porous, so anything you use soap-wise is just going to get into your pot and then into your beer. Um, the key seems to be airflow, all right? If, if I scrub them down with uh, just hot water and then dry them with a fan on them, no fungus. Uh, but if they don't get that airflow, it grows a ton of fungus. The other nice, nice thing is if you, uh, or if we are having this problem and we're really concerned about uh, the fungus uh, penetrating the pots, they're just low fire pots. Just throw them back in the kiln. Just throw them back in the kiln, bring it up to 1,000 degrees. At that point, everything's dead, everything's burned out. Yeah, it's been quite effective for us, quite effective. You know, anytime we want to start over again, we just hit the reset button, put it back in the kiln. Yeah. So uh, the conditioning pots that I've been using, uh, I have this problem inside. But I only have it at the top part of the pot where there's no liquid. So, you know, I put a lid on top of the pot, um, so there's sort of an air gap there at the top. And I grow all sorts of things like this on the surface. Uh, for the most part, though, this isn't interfering with the beer. The stuff on the outside is on the outside. It's not traveling back into the beer, I think, because of the positive pressure of the beer coming out. On the top, um, uh, if it comes in contact at all with the beer, it's just on the surface. I always siphon from the bottom, and you know, when I get near the bottom of, of, of the volume that I have, I leave a little behind, so I'm not really uh, introducing this into the beer. We've not had a problem with infected beer. We've had no infected beers. Even yet. though the pots often look like this, <laughs> we, we've not had a problem with infected beer. And uh, being a home brewer, I'm actually uh, uh, familiar with what infected beer <laughs> tastes like, so it, it's actually a, uh, a plus that we've been successful avoiding that. All right, back to these uh, big pots and some of the challenges. Um, 
I talked to, the, I pointed out the fact that Ben is responsible for transporting the uh, pots from the back of the uh, clay works inside so we can ferment. They're just too heavy once they're full of liquid. And this 14 gallon one, which I had in my living room, was just impossible for me to move. So here you see me transferring beer uh, from a plastic bucket in, into the uh, clay pot for. Uh, I mean, it's a 30 gallon pot. You fill it with 10 gallons of beer. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, you, you can't move it. And it's, one of, it's been a challenge moving these pots when they're full of, well, yeah. full of beer. Yeah. 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 Right. So current experiments. Um, this is actually a pot, oh, it's in the eight to nine gallon range that I uh, uh, used for fer some fermentation experiments. Uh, the idea was to uh, fill the, the pot with, with wort, uh, unfermented beer, add yeast, uh, just commercial brewer's yeast, uh, let it ferment, no problem. Uh, after a week, uh, drained it out, uh, cleaned the pot, drank the beer, uh, and then filled it with wort again, again, unfermented beer. But this time I didn't add yeast. I just uh, put a lid on it and let it go. Uh, I wanted to see if the, the porosity of the pot would actually act as starter for fermentation in the beer. Uh, and it turns out the answer is yes. Within uh, 24 hours, it was fermenting away, uh, and it actually fermented quicker than the one I actually physically added yeast to. Uh, and that's after cleaning the pot. So the porosity definitely acts as, can act as starter for your yeast. Yeah, this was great news for me because again, I was looking for these clay pots to replace uh, wooden barrels and wooden barrels are used in exactly that manner, especially in these sour beers that I mentioned. Um, uh, the Belgians will empty one, one beer and fill it up with another raw beer and, and let it condition to get that sourness and the extra uh, crazy flavors. Uh, so it's quite reassuring to know that, in fact, those little beasts are alive and well in the clay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I pushed it. You did. There. All right, so here we have a version that I commissioned. <laughs> um, uh, this, again, in my living room, uh, sits on the shelf next to the chair that I sit in, and I fill, fill this with finished beer for dispensing. And it's just at my, you know, just at hand. So that when I need a beer, I just lean over with the glass and fill my beer, fill my beer glass. Um, and it turned out to be a gorgeous pot. This is, uh, I don't know if anybody knows who Jeremy Wallace is. He demoed earlier yesterday. This is in with one of his soda firings, uh, unglazed on the interior. Uh, and it, 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 I mean, it got a great soda finish on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it turned out to be a gorgeous pot. Yep, it fits in well with the rest of my beer paraphernalia, as you can see. So what are we doing? Uh, more pots and more beer. I mean, we're still brewing away. Uh, uh, we, last month we're brewing a beer. Once the weather warms up, we'll be brewing a, a whole lot more because remember, this is an outdoor activity for us. Uh, this, is, this just scratches the surface of the number of pots we've built. Um, yeah. Yeah, more pots, more beer. Yeah. Uh, and as Ben mentioned, um, we looked at this micaceous clay, so I'm now trying my hand at throwing pots. This is a new thing for me. Uh, so I actually have been following these instructions I found on the web for doing these Apache bean pots using this New Mexican uh, micaceous uh, clay. A similar technique to the one Ben demoed of, uh, you know, pounding out the bottom and doing the coil. Uh, the bean pots are typically, you know, small and I'm trying to figure out if I can make them large enough that we could do a reasonable size beer on my kitchen stove. A popular popular, I wouldn't call it a fad, but a trend right now in home brewing is small batch home brewing. Typically we do at least five gallons, sometimes 10 gallon batches of beer. But um, a lot of people are doing actually one gallon batches of beer. It cuts down a lot on the time and the equipment that you need. Uh, it doesn't take long to boil a gallon of water. Um, so it just uh, speeds up the process. So I'm looking to get something like that that I can actually do on my stove. That's the goal of trying to play with a bean pot yeah, it's supposed technology to be, it's supposed to be sealed with bear fat. How's that? Going? And yeah, it's supposed to. They, they, those are the instructions. The for, uh, for the first use, you're supposed to seal the interior with uh, bear fat. Uh, I'm probably not going to do that technique, but yeah. So half the point of doing all this was to get other people involved. So if you want to get a hold of us, this is how you do so. Uh, there's actually a website, brewerandclay.com, that I really need to update. But there's an update coming for it in the next few weeks. Uh, and you can contact me there, uh, of course, uh, at my website, uh, where there's a ton of other stuff, uh, or at my email address. Yeah, same email. I mean, uh, we'll happily share any of our trials and tribulations, uh, successes and failures. 
nothing's proprietary. Uh, we're looking for people who are interested in playing in this area. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, Hey, we wanted to go 45 minutes, we went 44 and a half. So we have a fair amount of time for questions, um, and there's the microphone I'm to remind you of, so if you just want to walk up, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Hi, uh, that was great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, like the first part, you had handles on it, but the ones after you didn't, it was, what was the decision to take away the handles? They're just a liability. Um, the honest truth is I, I just didn't want them to break off while I'm, you know, I've got a 20 pound pot with 10, 10 pounds of grain in it, uh, another five gallons of water at, what is water, eight pounds a gallon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're heavy. Uh, and the, I, I just felt that the, the handles were a liability. I mean, they were a weak point. Uh, no matter how well I attach those handles, I, I just, I worry about them. Um, and frankly, I mean, you have to full body these things to pick them up anyway. Um, yeah. So do you really. pick them up by, like, bad Yes, bad. exactly. I, yeah, give them a bear hug and uh, yep. uh, remember some good body kinetics, body mechanics. Yep, body mechanics. Yeah. Lift, lift with our legs. We lift with our legs. No twisting. Thank you, sir. So I just have a question. Um, do you ferment in one of your pots and then transfer it to another one for conditioning? Uh, or do you do everything in one pot all the time? We've done a, we've all done of the a, above. We've done, yes, a variation on all of those. That very large 14-gallon pot that's in my living room, we didn't boil in that. We just transferred. Actually, I think I had a picture of us transferring from a plastic bucket into that. Right. And we do a lot of mash and boil uh, in the clay pot. Uh, and then transfer it to um, transfer it to a bucket and just ferment in the bucket. So we did mention this uh, ideal temperature range of 68 to 72, and we don't always have that in the studio. So we found it's a little better, uh, a little easier. We put it in a plastic bucket. We'll put it in Ben's basement or my living room and uh, ferment there, and then we have a little more control over the temperature. If the yeast get too warm, they start throwing off some uh, unwanted flavors, and so we're we're trying to make sure we don't introduce uh, variables into the tasting. We're looking for the impact of the clay on the taste, so we're trying to control some of the variables. Yes, sir. Uh, I understand the, the low fire and the porosity need for the uh, pots that you're boiling in, but have you considered doing like glazed, or finished glazed crockery more or less um, for your fermenting pots, or are, is there a reason to stick with that low fire clay that's seeping uh, for your fermentation? Part of the reason was to uh, uh, see what ancient cultures would be experiencing, um, and they didn't have the technology for these high fire pots. Uh, when it comes to glaze, I won't be glazing the interior probably of any of them because uh, it, it it's not that much different than, than fermenting in glass. And I can ferment in glass all I want with a carboy. Uh, so glazing, it, glazing the interiors really doesn't hold much for me. Now, in, in titrating up my firing temperature uh, until I get a, a nice balance of uh, porosity uh, or lack of porosity, um, is an option um, and one we're exploring. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's definitely so it, not, not glaze on the inside. I just think it's, it's the yeah. same as fermenting in glass. It's non-reactive. Um, it, it's a great observation that for the conditioning, right, we could do that. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the one that was soda fired. Yeah. That, that's, was that vitrified? Did you say that? Yeah, that's vitrified. So yeah, it's non-porous. And so that's one I want to make sure that it's one, it's not leaking on my, you know, my shelf there. But, um, also, because of that conditioning phase, I actually don't want porosity. I don't want oxygen interacting with the beer. Uh, if you expose your beer to oxygen, it ends up tasting like wet cardboard. Uh, you want to avoid that. Yeah, that soda so, fire pot, uh, we crushed cone 12 with that. That thing's really vitreous. Yeah. So there's this trade-off right now in terms of what kind of experiments we're doing. And to be honest, we're not being scientific at all, uh, just because that would have been too much like work. And uh, so we've been playing just with this. If we can only fire it to whatever number you told. 018. Oh, yeah, the, the, the really yeah. low is 018. Then what yeah. can we do? How would people make beer there? Now, once we start saying, well, let's make really good beer in clay pots, then what you're thinking is exactly the direction I think we need to go. We need to play with all of these newer technologies that we have and still stay in clay and see what 
the beer interacting with the clay medium really could bring to the flavor profile. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yes, please. Hi, uh, what are your thoughts about using a water seal like as in a um, sauerkraut jar? Only works for high fire pots. Uh, not gonna work for a porous pot because it's not gonna hold the water. Uh, that, if, um, I wish I could show it. We there is one, there is one where um, I did put the, that, that gallery in for a water seal with the lid. Uh, I tried to hold the water using beeswax. Uh, Sorry, I forgot that. Um, it doesn't work uh, because I'm still trying to boil in that pot. So I get to the point where I melt the beeswax, it sucks the beeswax in uh, or burns the beeswax. It, it just didn't work. Um, because if, if I'd have then applied, if I'd have brought it to a lower temperature and then applied the beeswax, and then put the water in with the lid on top, uh, possibly. Um, so that would have been an option, but it's just really hard with these porous pots. Yeah, I mean, they just, water just goes through them like a sieve. Your, your idea is one that I had before I met Ben. I had found these large uh, sauerkraut crocks. Yeah, kimchi jars, everybody for sale. does that water sale. And I was thinking, well, you know, uh, maybe I could do this, right? Look, just looking for, I like to brew different kind of beers. I'm a big fan of uh, beers with no hops in them, very traditional, they're called gruets. You know, before the 11th century, the, the beer was not made with hops, and so I, I play with those recipes. So I was looking for some, some variety in my techniques, and what you suggest is something I considered. But then I ran into this guy, and then we went down that garden path, you know. Yeah, and I tried one where I, I tried to actually seal the lid on a little bit with beeswax, melt it on, and then put the lid right on. Uh, and uh, air still got in to some extent, but then I had to really pry the lid off and really stuck it on there pretty well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm wondering if uh, you could use a drill pump to siphon beer from some of these bigger vessels, or would that disturb the carbonation and... Yeah, so, so I, have a, I have a pump, sir. You're, you're thinking right along the line. Small pumps, uh, even high temperature pumps are available for home brewing. They're used extensively in commercial brewing. Yeah. That's how they move all their, all their liquids. Yeah, makes sense. I have such a beast. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, pumping or siphoning one way I, or another, I have to move the beer. Great. Um, the pump that I have um, tends to be messy. I usually use it outside. Uh, it comes in very handy when I do my 10-gallon batches, just because it takes a long time to move 10 gallons of liquid. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're absolutely you're right on target. That's a that's a that's a standard technique and a really good one uh, for use in home brewing. Great. I did Thanks. try great, great lecture, by the way. Oh, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank, thank you. you very much. I did try siphoning uh, out of uh, after boiling, uh, and it I just could not. It, it just kept clogging with all the uh, hops. with with the grain and, and the hops. The grain, you I have a problem with siphoning. Absolutely, that way. Yeah. I had to use a sieve. Yeah, we, there, we have to build in ways to strain out the grain from the liquid. Even in regular, you know, non-clay home brewing, you have to worry about such, such issues. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. That's great. Yes, ma'am. I've done uh, quite a bit of cooking in low fire pots on direct coals. Fantastic. At, yeah, very fun. Yeah. But small pots, small, yeah. you know. One of the things that I found helpful for uh, uh, controlling seepage is burnishing the pot. Uh -huh. And if the um, clay body is too groggy and burnishing is too much of a pain, then put a couple of layers of terra sigillata and then burnish it. Yeah, I use terra sigillata. Uh, um, I, I do a lot of pit firing, a lot, a lot of pit firing. Usually OM4 uh, is my standard white. Um, uh, but at these temperatures, uh, I find that and I've done this. I've done these tests. Uh, uh, OM4, uh, even if it's the finest, finest particles of OM4 fired to O18, is still really, really, really porous. Uh, so and terra sigillata is a very, very fine layer. Um, right. It, it just does not. Uh, um, yeah. I, I mean, the name means the name means earth seal, uh, and everybody thinks of of terra sigillata as a seal. It is. It is not. Uh, it is still very porous. Is it less porous than OM4? Mm -hmm. uh, with then like soldate where you've got a ton of sand in it or something like that is it less porous than that yeah is it less porous than my clay body yeah so i could probably mitigate some of my porosity with a, a little bit of terra sigillata on the inside um but it's just such a fine delicate layer i mean 
and it doesn't, it does not cure the porosity thing. Yeah. It, it's still porous. Um, I think, I think one of the keys to doing, uh, are your pots, are, are they sealed with something, uh, wax, oil, no, or fat No, no, I don't seal them at all. They Is it a micaceous kind of, clay? Yeah, are um, these your pots, or what do you make them from? I, I make them from earthenware, okay. just uh, commercially made earthenware, and they usually, after a couple, you know, I cook foods in them, right. so mm -hmm. they get a layer of oil in them, yeah, too, yeah, just that, naturally, that, that and that helps, but and I also find the burnishing is pretty helpful. And how are you firing them? I'm firing, well, some of them I fire in the pit, most of them in uh, okay. electric. Okay. Pit. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So the bean pots that I'm reading about, they're, they're right. right. The that's same sort of a right? thing. So. That's cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. That's you wonderful. bet. Thank you. I'm so excited to hear you're doing that, too. That's really great. Yes, sir. Yes. You were mentioning be, uh, bean pots. If you go online, when you use a bean pot, they tell you that you have to cure it. And there's uh, numerous ways of doing that. Yeah. Uh, too numerous to mention, but it's supposed to take care of the leakage problem. Right. So and yeah, everything from earthen beeswax work. to I've read uh, <laughs> soak it in milk for three days. I've heard about yeah. the milk one. Uh, yeah. So the bear fat. We mentioned the bear fat. That's the first one I read about. Apparently that's uh, traditional. But um, there's an issue with um, what kinds of things I want to come in contact with the beer. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to try to carbonate the beer, which we do because we're making these American pale ales as our experiments, yeah. uh, I really can't have any fat in the beer because the fat plays with the surface tension and I can't get carbonation then. How about I, garlic? I can't get a head, right? I, I'll, I'll have a beer, but I won't get a head. One so, of them was uh, smearing garlic on the... Ooh, garlic, yeah, that would be a good beer. Right? No, yeah. I'm teasing. But no, I, mean, I probably really, wouldn't make a garlic beer. I, really, I'm sure people have made garlic beers. But yes, but I haven't, if you uh, get online, there's various well, ways you. you can do it. No, I appreciate that point. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're still, I mean, we're, we're still, uh, the experiments continue to this day. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah. Because that was in the uh, Dominican Republic, and they used a sour orange peel to do it. Now, mm -hmm. that would be fantastic. One of that the beers be I make is a Belgian wit, and that's flavored with coriander. Get a little mm -hmm. lemon from that. But then uh, some sort of citrus peel. Or citrus oil. Yeah. We uh -huh. could right. that. So um, that could yeah. be a very nice, I uh, have a dedicated Belgian wit. Okay. Um, that wonderful idea, sir. I can't thank you enough. That's okay. fantastic. And I, I think we're at the point where he's about to remind me. Uh, if there are further questions, please, can we take them outside? We'll be yeah, glad we'll be to answer the door. anything you need, but uh, we need to not intrude really on the next people's time. really appreciate you coming time. by. really do. Thanks so much for your time.